All right, good morning. So someone told me you guys were the most exciting group of all three services. Is that true? I don't know. I don't know. Pretty sleepy in here. So anyway, good morning, everyone. Welcome to all those who are online today joining us. So hopefully you got an outline as you walked in today. And if you're watching online, you can also download the outline to follow along today. We are in chapter three of Jonah. We're going through the book of Jonah. We've got one more week, got this week, and then one extra week. And then we'll start a new Christmas series. Woohoo! Come on, you don't believe that. You are not excited about Christmas. Come on now. They just put away the Halloween stuff at the store, and then it's crazy, isn't it? So, um, so the book of Jonah, because that's what we're talking about today, right? So remind me. Um, so the book of Jonah is oftentimes viewed as a children's story, um, something that is you read in preschool, you read in children's church, that kind of thing. But actually, the book of Jonah is an amazing story of God's grace and mercy, But also, it's a challenging book for people to take their next step in their spiritual journey. And uh, you've heard me say before, I believe that as believers in Christ, God is always calling us to take that next step in our spiritual journey. And God was calling Jonah to take a next step, and he went the other direction. Um, But for us, God is always calling us to take that next step. And, And so we've looked at, we're looking at the book of Jonah from a spiritual growth perspective of really kind of challenging ourselves to make sure that we're growing spiritually and that we are taking that spiritual next step in our journey. And so today, as we kind of walk through it, we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about the challenges and whatnot that we need to take, all right? So uh, if you will, if you have your outlines or if you have your Bibles, you could follow along. If our computer doesn't crash, we're going to have it up on the screen. We're having some technical issues today. Um, So in chapter one, we looked at this in week one, the word of the Lord in chapter one, verse one, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, okay? And God told Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh to preach, okay? Now, he didn't like the people in Nineveh. They were, they were enemies of Israel, and so Nineveh was part of, was the capital city of the Assyrian nation. They were brutal people. Um, they, when they had wars, they didn't care if you were a child, if you were a lady, doesn't, it doesn't matter. They were brutal. And so they would, um, they would kill them. They would kill children. They would kill adults. They, it didn't matter. <clears throat> Oftentimes at the end of the war, they would take the men that they captured and they would skin them alive. Right, And then they would place them under uh, in the sand, and they would bury them up to about their neck or their shoulders, right? They would take a nail, and they would drive it through the bottom of their, uh, through their tongue into the bottom of their jaw, and they would just leave them like that. And then what I've been telling you the last couple of weeks, I realized that I was wrong. I, I told you that after they would do that, then they would force them to listen to Britney Spears' music. And I was wrong, and I apologize. It actually was Madonna, because she's old enough to be around, all right? So I made a comment about that. I said, well, maybe next week I'll talk to, say, Johnny Cash. And there was a bunch of people going, ooh, like that. So it's like, okay, we won't go with Johnny Cash, all right? Elvis or something. I don't know. Pick pick a person. So in chapter 1... Uh, Jonah decides, and we have a little screen here, up a, a map on the screen here, and I got my little handy-dandy pointer. And so <clears throat> here he is, he's going to set sail in the Joppa area, and so God had called him to go to Nineveh, so short distance away, he could have jumped on a camel, not a problem, got up there, preached in Nineveh. He chooses not to. So the word of the Lord comes to him, go to Nineveh, he's like, no, nah, I'm good, God. So he jumps on a, 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 a boat in Joppa. And begins to set sail over to Tarshish, which would be modern day Spain. And it's about 1,200 miles away. Some commentary guys think that it would be somewhere around a year for him to get there. So he jumps on the boat and God says, you know what? I'm going to send a storm into your life. And so he sends a storm into Jonah's life. And as, as a result of Jonah being disobedient, it affects everyone on the ship. Right, And, and so the, the captain comes to Jonah and says, hey, you need to pray to your God to have this thing stopped. And Jonah's like, nah, I'm good. I'm just going to keep doing it. 
And so he doesn't pray. The sailors come in and it's like, what have you done? We're going to draw straws and figure out what's going on. And so they, it comes to, it's Jonah's fault. Jonah says, hey, just throw me overboard and the storm will stop. Uh, will stop right? And, and, and so the guys are like, well, we can't do that. They actually had more grace and mercy than, than, than others. And so they don't throw them over. They start throwing things overboard to save the ship. The storm continues to rage. It feels like it's busting up the ship. And so finally they get to a point and they say, Jonah, we're sorry. God forgive us. And they grab them by the arm and the leg and they did a one, two, and then he did a great big old back flip, flip belly flop, and he landed in the water, and in the end of chapter one says, and God provided a fish to swallow him up. And so last week we looked, he lived in that belly of the fish for three days and three nights, all right? And so at the end of chapter three, he gets coughed out. He is a big old pus ball with no hair, and if you missed last week's message, you need to hear just that part because that was the only part that was any good. Right, guys? All right. So good. Okay. The last week, last uh, service, the guys were very sheepish. I'm like, right, guys? And it's like, all right. So it's the same response I got when I was here at six in the morning going through it. Okay. So, so uh, he's a big pus ball. He decides at that time that he's going to be obedient. And so here we pick up in chapter three. So y'all ready? All right. So chapter 3 is a picture of God's grace. Chapter 2 is the psalm of Jonah, a prayer, a beautiful prayer. Chapter 3 is about God's grace, all right, and how it relates into our life as well, all right? So it says in verse 1, when the word of the Lord came to Jonah, a, what's the two words, a second time. He didn't deserve it, right? He didn't earn it. He, he didn't have any, he didn't kind of make God happy, but God comes to him a second time in his life. Number one in your outline, follow along, is we worship a God of second chances. And someone ought to applaud that, right? And it might be two comma with a whole bunch of zeros behind it. Could be two to the power of 10,000, right? But we serve a God of second chances. So the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time, okay? Now, when, when you looked at that picture, Jonah wasn't just a little bit off center of where God was calling him. God was saying, I want you to go that way. And Jonah went 180 degrees the opposite direction that way. Oftentimes in our life as believers, God calls us to do something, and we're going to talk about that today, and he gives us that impression, he gives us the guidance in our life, and, and we're not 180 degrees off the op, uh, of the direction of God, sometimes we're just 20% off or 30% off of the direction of what God is calling us to do, right? So in this case, Jonah, he is 180 degrees off of the direction of what God is calling him, and yet still the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. And in your outline in, uh, from last week, chapter 2, verse 9, <clears throat> Jonah makes this commitment in the belly of the fish, right? He says, what I have vowed, I will make good. Now, we don't know all the things that it was because the prayer is just a very small port, uh, part of the three days that he spent in the belly of the whale, but I'm sure that he made a lot of deals with God, right? I'm sure that he spent a lot of time, and maybe there's not enough pages in the Bible to document all of the prayers that he had or all the commitments that he made to God. So, so here it is. He's going to make good for what it is that God has called him and what he is ultimately called to do, all right? But, but what's amazing to me is that the, the, the insurance that we have is that God comes to him even when he didn't deserve it. So in your life, the same thing is true. You don't deserve it. You didn't earn it. And for you, it might not be the second time. It could be the gazillionth time. And God's grace still comes to you, right? Because we worship that God of second chances. So I busted out my poor man's computer, my Etsy sketch. <laughs> It's in my office. I've had it in my office for all these years. I don't know when I use it as an illustration. But it's a reminder to me of God's grace. 
right? <clears throat> and so for those of you who are younger than me, you know, uh, when I was a kid, this is what you had to play with in the back of the car when you went on trips. We didn't have 75-inch televisions in the back of our headrest in front of our parents, <laughs> right? You know, you know what I'm saying, right? The, the thing that falls down from the ceiling, <clears throat> right? We had this, and, and what it reminds me of, so some of you reminiscing about your old, the old days, you know, you would draw a picture, and if you didn't like it, which I couldn't even draw a straight line, and then you do one of these things, right? And it's a reminder of God's grace. You mark up your life. You screw up your life. You can't draw a straight line with your life. And we have the privilege, because we worship a God of second chances, to take out our Etch-a-Sketch, and repent and say, God, forgive me. And he cleans our slate, right? He cleans our slate. In fact, he tells us that he remembers it no more. You remember it. In fact, you probably have a harder time forgiving yourself, right? But God doesn't remember. He, he, he releases you of that. And, and here Jonah, he's experienced this. He's 180 degrees in the wrong direction. And yet God still comes to him as a second chance God. So verse 2 goes on, and he says, God says to Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim, uh, proclaim to it the message that I'm going to give you. So God is going to give him a message. And, and so the word go in your outline in the Hebrew, it's the word kum, like zoom, but with a, with a K or a C, kum, and it's yilak, right? And, and so in the English language, we would say, God is saying to you, go immediately, right? That there's like an urgent thing. You can't stand around and go, well, you know, I'm not really sure, and I'm going to find five people and bounce it off of them. The word of the Lord has come to you a second time, and you need to go now. You need to move, you, you need to be obedient to what he has called you to. The first time, God says, hey, go to Nineveh, and, and Jonah's like, no, nah, I'm good. The second time it comes to him, and he's like, no, I need to pay attention. I need to listen, and I need to be willing to do that. Number two in your outline, what has God called you to do that you need to do now? What has God called you to do that you need to do now in your life? We talked about this in week one. God speaks to us. He's spoken to Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden in Genesis at the very beginning of creation. And God has placed in the life of believers the Holy Spirit. And God speaks to us through pastors and teachers and the Bible and all kinds of different things. He gives us impressions. He gives us what, you know, however you want to determine that. He speaks into your life. What has he called you to do? And what do you need to do not someday, not when the kids are grown, or when the grandkids are this, when that, the other thing. I mean, what is it that God is calling you to do that you need to do it now, do it immediately? This, this is where Jonah's at. And Jonah is going to begin to move quickly. He's going to move right away. He's not going to stand around. He's not going to talk about it. And so it says in, in, in uh, the second part of that verse, it says to go to the great city of Nineveh. Okay, now Nineveh was not a great city because the people were great. They were fierce people. They were hated people. It was great because it was a city of influence and power, right? We might say for us some great places, you know, France, San Francisco, Chicago, San, uh, New York, right? Washington, D.C., right? We, we might say that. And so in chapter 4, it tells us that there was 120,000 people that couldn't tell their left hand from their right hand, so they had the same political system we had. <laughs> Come on, that's funny. Go ahead, you can laugh, all right? Just kidding. All right, how can you get an Ivy League school and not know your right hand from your left hand? Anyway, <clears throat> moving on. So we think that that was just adults. So there was probably 600,000 people who lived in it. There was a wall that was for, all the way around it was a fortified city, and it was, a, it was the capital. 
right? And, and so it's a great city because of its influence in the community or in the, in the, in the country and so forth. And, and so God calls him to go there. And then in verse 3, it says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, and he went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city, and it required three days. And so what they believed, and we're going to come back to this at the end, what they believed is Jonah went in there, and he proclaimed the message that God had given him. And then it began to spread. It wasn't that he had a coliseum, and everyone showed up, and he heard it, like a kind of a Billy Graham concert, uh, uh, conference kind of thing. He went to areas in the community. He shared the message, and then the individuals carried the message to their family members. And it spread throughout the community in a very short period of time. 600,000, you know, if you you take that estimate, which I think is kind of a conservative estimate, 600,000 people would hear hear the message. And and so he goes to there, and then in verse 4, it says, on the first day, Jonah, in circle the word started, started into the city. All right. So the very first day he started in, and, and the word start in the word in the Hebrew, which is in your outline, no fill in the blank, but you can just look at it. The word started means to untie or loosen. All right. So so let's just kind of get this visual. So the word of the Lord comes to him, first chapter two. He doesn't he doesn't do it, right? In chapter two, in chapter one, in chapter two, he tells us that those who hold on to worthless idols are fools and they forfeit the grace, not heaven and hell grace, but they forfeit the grace and that word means the pursuing love of God, okay? They forfeit the pursuing love of God in their life. So for Jonah to start heading into Nineveh to preach, he had to cut loose or untie what he was holding on to mentally that prevented him from being obedient to God. In your life, in my life, we have idols, not statues, but we have idols in our life that we hold on to. And oftentimes God calls us to do something. And he calls us to do it now, right? Do it now. Do it immediately. And we're holding on to those idols. And those idols, we're not willing to release it. And so the visual I gave you last week was you have one, plant, one foot planted in the kingdom of God. And when you go to Bible study and you go to church and you listen to Christian music on the way home from work or to work, I mean, it's like, God, you can do anything. You can move mountains. Anything is possible for you. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. And then you have the other foot planted in this earth. And all the things of this world hold you down. And it prevents you from moving forward. And in Jonah's life, we know that it was prejudiced against the Ninevites. He didn't like them. He wanted God to destroy them. And the second thing is his self. God said, hey, Jonah, I want you to go. And and Jonah basically said to God, similar to what we say, thanks for the invite, God. I'm not interested. And so we just kind of come back as we're looking at Jonah through the, the, the eyes or the prism of spiritual growth. What is God calling you to do? that you need to do now, and what is it that's holding you back that you need to release? Maybe it's security from a job that you think you have, right? And I always like to say, hey, your job is not your provider. God is your provider, right? Maybe it's oftentimes we're we're surrounded with unbelievers in our family. Maybe you're the only believer. You're the strong believer in the family. And you sense God calling you to do something, and, and, and you're, you're, you're reluctant to say anything because you don't want to be considered kind of, you know, a religious nut job. You know, I remember my dad when I'm like, hey, I feel called to the ministry. He goes, how are you going to take care of your family? Right? I mean, it was like right out of his mouth. Do you believe God is your provider? Right? And, and so we hold on to relationships. We hold on to things that are our idols, and they're not, maybe not necessarily bad, but it prevents us from being obedient in our life. 
Uh, oftentimes I've seen this with, with, with ladies who want to, to date or to have a spiritual leader, their husband, future husband, to be a spiritual leader in their home, and yet they, they're dating someone who isn't a spiritual leader. How is that going to work? Right? We're holding on to things, and we need to unloosen, and we need to let go of, and we need to begin to move forward. Y'all with me? Yes. Number three in your outline Sometimes we are tied to things that keep us from obeying God, right? And that's the stuff that you have to work through and you have to begin to release. So verse four, so on the first day, Jonah starts into the city and he proclaims, and we're going to just stop right there. Um, I I don't know if maybe you have a job where you communicate or you're a communicator or you teach things or whatever in, in your school or business or whatever it is. And, and so for me, not so much on Sunday, although I do a little bit, but, but uh, if I'm going to go speak to a different group of people, I always like to try to put myself and in, in kind of get into their mindset and figure out who they are and what their interests are and all that kind of stuff to communicate, to bring Jesus into their, into their life, right? And, and so here I got my mind of Jonah. God says, hey, Jonah, you need to go. Second time, you need to head to Nineveh. And I'm thinking what Jonah is probably walking back thinking about what that message that God is going to give him. And I'm guessing that he is negotiating with God like crazy because he's going into a group of people that hate him, that aren't interested in anything of God. Right? People who think cutting heads off and putting him in a pyramid is a great idea. Right? And he's walking in to this, and I'm just thinking in my mind, he's probably saying, Hey, God, I got a great outline for my, my, my message to give him. First, we got to have him think happy thoughts. Right? Nineveh, you need to think happy thoughts. Second, you need to be kind to prophets that you don't like. Right? And third, <laughs> you got to give me a chance to get out of town before you kill me. <laughs> right? And, and so God gives them a message, and here's the message. It's five Hebrew words, eight English words. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. Right? Forty days. Not an uplifting message. Not three thoughts of having a happy life. Right? There's no joke, there's no poem, there's no sarcasm, <laughs> there, isn't, there isn't any of that stuff. It's just simply, in, 30, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overturned. And the, word, the Hebrew word for overturn has two meanings. And the first one is, it, it can mean overturned or destroyed, or it can mean overturned and changed. So the message that they would have heard is you have 40 days and either it's going to be overturned and destroyed or it's going to be overturned and it's going to be changed, right? And so you could imagine how that message would be received. Number four in your outline, that we serve a merciful God and God's mercy is a limited time offer. Right, God's mercy is a limited time offer. And, and I like to say that God's mercy is offered to us for as long as we're alive. God's mercy pursues us. His grace is available to us. But the clock is ticking. And this is the message that they got. Not someday, 40 days. Right? And, and you could imagine that 60-minute talk, click, you know, timer that on the old 60-minute shows, click, click. Right, as they hear the message, right? Time, time is escaping, and so they have to do something. Verse five, Nineveh believed God. And we'll just, we'll just stop right there. Nineveh doesn't believe Jonah. Nineveh believes God. So, so here's my prayer, and this has been my prayer for like 20 years. Every time I come out onto the stage, I've, I pray a simple prayer. The guys have all kinds of different prayers. Mine's pretty simple. It's God, I want my people to see me and hear you. Right? And then I have a visual, because I'm a visual learner. I have a visual of some kind of conduit pipe from heaven coming down and planted in the top of my cranium. <laughs> right? 
So here it is. Sorry, folks, this is all I have to offer. But my prayer is that you hear God. You don't, don't believe me, right? Believe God. Nineveh believed God. And so what would that look like? Well, for the first readers to hear Nineveh believed, they, the first response would have been, there is no way. So imagine this, if we were to bring it into our culture. Imagine you woke up this morning, y'all are awake, right? You woke up this morning, however you get your news, computer, you know, email, whatever it is, newspaper, whatever it is, you open it up, and there in big, bold letters, it says, Hollywood has repented, and they all follow Jesus. <laughs> That's the response that they would have thought. What if they said this, right? You open up your, your, your computer, and you go to your news feed, and it says, all of Las Vegas Strip has been surrendered to Jesus, and now it's houses of worship. Right? Or what if you turned on your channel, the news channel, and it said, Washington, D.C. has experienced a revival, and all of them have given their heart. Never mind. Yeah. How would you, exp- I mean, what would your thought be for that to take place? Right? So, so this is what it would be for people who are reading about the Ninevites, that they all believe God. Their response would have been laughter. They wouldn't have believed it. It would have been too difficult uh, for, them, for them to believe. So it says, Nineveh believed God, and the verse goes on, and it says, and they declared a fast, and we'll get into that in, in a moment, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Okay, a fast in the Old Testament was a symbol of humility and repentance, okay? So if you were going to fast in the Old Testament, it was a sign that you were going to, you were taking a position of submission to God. You were surrendering to God. You were confessing the the issues that you have. And then it says they put on sackcloth um, clothing. Sackcloth clothing, I did a little bit of research, is made from goat hair. Okay, now I was going to bring my goat hair jacket out, but I couldn't find it in my closet, right? I have a cool one, and so I, I couldn't find it, and, and so, but my understanding is, I don't have one, but my understanding is, is the goat hair is really wiry, so they, they described it as putting on an old potato sack, old burlap. I have burlap in my garage that I put over my oranges when it freezes. So you could imagine putting on your burlap jacket, and wearing it. So for me, maybe you had the same mom as I had, my mom, when I was in elementary school, washed uh, her curtains, her her drapes, that were made of spun glass. She washed them in the wash machine and then put in all of our, uh, all the boys' underwear in the next load. (laughs) Right? We weren't laughing. Right? So we're both, my brother and I are both in the nurse's office at school. You know, we're doing this. My dad calls my mom. He's like, what on earth did you do? She's like, I, I washed the clothes and I put it. He's like, you got to throw all that stuff away. Right? So you could imagine how uncomfortable it would be. So they all sport, they all put the, the, this, uh, this uh, clothing on, the sackcloth clothing. Verse 6 goes on. It says, when the news reached the king of Nineveh, He rose from his throne, he took off his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, so he's going to do the same thing, and sat in the dust. For a king to do that, it was surrendering his power, because we don't have royalty in our our nation, but for them, the, the, the chair, the throne, was a position of power. And so for a king to step away from that was surrendering, because the chair represented his kingdom and all of his military might that he has. And so when he steps away from it, that was a surrendering part. He's submitting and he's surrendering to it. And then it says that he took off the robe. And the robe, you would never see a king without his robe. Because he didn't want the peasants to think anything less of him. And so he would always have that royalty on because that was a part of his power that he had. And so here he takes it off. 
And he sits down in, da- uh, in, in, uh, in the dust. And verse 7, it says, Then he issued a proclamation to, to the Ninevites, and it says to Nineveh, and it says, By a decree of the king and the nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd, flock, or anything, do not let them eat or drink. Right? So there is a fast that's going to take place in this whole area. Right? Not just with the adults, with the kids, with the animals as well. I, I, I read one guy, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I thought it was pretty funny, and I added some stuff to it. But he, he says if you have uh, 20 heads of uh, cow, ca- cattle, and you don't feed them for one day, that you could hear their mooing for a mile away. Okay? And I added this. I said if you have one kid, and you don't feed them every five minutes, you can hear them five miles away. <laughs> right? Is that true? <clears throat> right? Mom, I'm hungry. So, so anyhow, no, no, no one's eaten anything. Verse 8, uh, do not let the, the, uh, the men or the beast eat, cover them with sackcloth. And then the verse goes on and it says, let everyone call urgently to God. Right? And, and just kind of pause for a moment. Because what they're doing is they're praying that God is going to spare them of the destruction. And there's an urgent call for them to pray to their God. I don't know how it looks in your life, but we probably have family members that are far from God. They don't have a personal relationship with Christ. Is there there the urgency to call out to God, to intercede on their behalf, to touch their hearts? And I I don't mean just kind of like, oh, Lord, open their hearts. But I mean to urgently call, that, 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 that phrase is, is a passionate, that they believed that God could do anything, right? We, we sang that song, and you guys sing it with enthusiasm, but do you believe it? Or do you sing it, and then it's over, and then you leave, and you wonder, right? So with urgency, they call on God, and then he goes on, and the king says, let them give up their evil ways, and their violence, right? And, and I shared this a couple weeks ago, or a couple series ago, that, that the danger in church is that we have moments where God speaks to our heart, and we feel what we call conviction, right? All of a sudden, we're listening, we're singing, we're doing whatever, and it's like God just comes in and pays us a visit, and we're reminded of something that we shouldn't do or something that we should do, and we feel close to God in that moment, It's like, God, you are so awesome. Thank you so much. And we feel convicted and we leave and we take no action. Conviction when it's only an emotion and it doesn't turn to action is dangerous in our spiritual life. Because we feel like we've had an encounter with God, but we haven't done anything about it. God says, hey, go this way. You're like, okay, I feel that passion, Lord, but I'm just going to do my own thing, right? And and so here he says that they turned from their evil ways and their violence. And then in verse 9, it says, who knows, right? And And I love that phrase, right? Who knows what God can do, right? I mean, we say, oh, God can do all things, and we believe that, right? One person believes it. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn uh, from his fierce anger so that we're not punished. that That they experience the grace that God desires to give us. And so I have a question in there for you. And and this is just kind of a pause and just kind of to reflect because I think Jonah is a spiritual growth message. And, And that is... What do you spiritually ache for in your life? What is it? Is it a family member? Is it a relationship? Is it finances? I mean, what is it that can move your spirit to passion, to call on the name of the Lord, who can move the mountains, that can take the hardest of hearts and penetrate, can't he? What is it that you spiritually ache for in your life. Maybe you don't, and maybe that's where you need to start, right? Maybe you need to start with that. 
40 days, Nineveh is going to be changed or destroyed. Number five in your outline, and here is the good news. God shows us his amazing grace, number five. So God gives them the grace that they needed. The grace that Jonah was a, at the very beginning in chapter one didn't want to go and proclaim because he knew that their hearts would be changed. And so here it is, their hearts are changed and he experiences it. And I don't want to, you know, you guys can go and read chapter four because it's an interesting ending in the, in the story of Jonah. You would think that one of the most fruitful revivals in history that Jonah would be thrilled. And is he? No. Not at all. So here's what God says, and in, 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 uh, Jonah says to, uh, about God in, in chapter 3, verse 10. <clears throat> when God saw what they did, right, not the conviction, but the action. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he uh, had threatened. They experience God's grace. You know what you experience every day? God's grace. You know what you deserve? Destruction. But he doesn't give that to you. He gives you his grace. And he gives you a second time and a third time and a fifth time and a thousandth time and ten thousandth time. And what we need to do in our spiritual life is we need to take that next step in that spiritual life that God is calling us to. So how do you respond, real quick as we wrap up, how do you respond to a God like that? Number one is take him up on his second chance, right? So, some of you who might be here, maybe you're watching on the internet, and, and, and God has given you a second chance, and the issue isn't God forgiving you, the issue is you forgiving yourself, that you need to accept his second chance, and begin to move forward in your life, regardless of what your past is, regardless of what you've done in your past. Second, number two, is you gotta believe what he says. Do you believe that? Do you believe God's word? Not a lot of yeses. Yes. Number three is repent, right? Maybe there's a, maybe there's a, a person here that, you know, God has just laid on your heart that there's some areas of your life that you need to come clean with. And, and again, the good thing is, is we worship a God of second chances and he's quick to forgive, isn't he? Right? And he wants it. He wants to forgive you. He wants to set you free. Number four in your outline is fast. And if you've never fasted before, um, I put together, uh, along with a coach that I had years ago, um, I put together a, a pamphlet. It's like three pages or six pages or something like that. It's on the way out. And if you're interested in fasting, there's all kinds of different ways of fasting. But you could try it, right? See, and you could do a one-day fast. You could do a lunch fast. You could do, do that. But you could, it, it explains biblically what it is and what the purpose is. And so make sure if you're interested, grab a paper on the way out. And then the last one, and it's on the two side tables on the, on the entryway out. And then the last one is spread the good news to others. And I think that that, that was what was so amazing to me. In Nineveh, people of 600,000 people, the word spread of God's grace. And you want to know how it spread? Jonah preached, and then people took that message, and they went to their family members. And they shared with their family members. 40 days, Nineveh will be overturned, destroyed, overturned, changed. And I wonder for us, is there an urgency on our part to share with people that we love, that Jesus loves them and he desires a personal relationship with them? Do you have that urgency? You're not responsible for the response you're only responsible for bringing them the good news. Is that, are you passionate about that? Do you believe that? That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? They believed God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity. And Lord, as we, as we just prepare our hearts to leave here today, 
Lord, I don't know what you're calling each of the folks to take their next step spiritually. I'm not sure what it is, Lord, but I pray that you will give them the boldness to take that step, that they will go and they will go now and they will trust you and they will live a life that's faithful. Father, that you will give them the boldness to do that. And Lord, I, my prayer is that we would leave here not convicted, but transformed. That our life would radically be different because we've experienced your love and grace. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, perhaps you're here today or you're watching online and you've never invited Jesus into your life and I wanna give you that opportunity to do so. And we just do a little ABC, it's not a formula, it's just a way that we track it. But A is admit that we're sinners. Every single one of us in here are sinners, we all sin. B is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross and that he rose again. And C is to confess him to be your Lord and Savior. And so if you're here or you're online and you desire to invite Jesus into your life, just say this prayer silently, repeat after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, today, I admit that I'm a sinner and I believe, Jesus, that you are the Christ the Son of God, that you died on a cross and that you rose again. And today, I confess you to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you you for making me a brand new creation in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, there's a number to text. If you're online, you can text that number. Uh, We'll get the information. If you're here in person, Pastor Eric mentioned the communication card. You fill out the communication card, and then there's some boxes on the way out. Just put committed my life to Christ. Drop it in the bag so we can get you some information. There's also some green bags on the way out too with that same information to help you to grow in your spiritual life, all right? So I'm gonna ask you all to stand. Are you alert? Remember, I was bragging on you. I heard that you guys were the best of the three groups. I don't know. You're fading pretty quick. All right. Well, the good news is the other group's outside and we're going to have a fight. So we're going to decide. <laughs> Might as well. It's church, right? So, so here, here, here it is. All right. God is calling all of you to take a spiritual step in your life. And he's calling you today because I believe that that's our, our spiritual life is a journey and we take step after step after step. What is the step that God is calling you to take? And today... Will you commit to taking that step? And who knows what God can do in your life? And my prayer is before you hit that first set of doors, that you will have made a commitment, right? Just as Jonah did, to be obedient to that next step in your spiritual life. God bless you guys. We will see you on the way out. Wow, what an incredible experience. Remember, we go live every weekend, so be sure to hit subscribe on our channel so you can be notified whenever we upload new content. I also want to invite you to join us in person when you get a chance. Joining us for one of our in-person services is a great way to meet and interact with new people in our Laurel Ridge family. You can find out more about Laurel Ridge and activities for your whole family by visiting our website. We can't wait to see you next time. Until then, have a great week, and remember, God loves you.